Good morning, everybody. All Christian humanists unite. It is April 20th, but I'm recording this for the April 21st Tuesday class of 2020. As always, I hope you guys are doing very well, and I miss you. No question about that. I would love to see all of you. Uh, it would be fantastic. So anyway, like I said, I hope you guys are all doing well. I ran into a carny yesterday, three of them actually, and that was very exciting. So I at least got to see part of our class, uh, which was very, very nice. And it's actually, I'm probably a little goofy and giddy this morning because it is sunny and it's supposed to be in the 50s today like it was yesterday. I also, well, I should do a couple of housekeeping things, shouldn't I? So uh, not only a shout out to Paul, so glad I ran into him yesterday, but at least a shout out to uh, Emma as well, because I know she's Eastern Orthodox, and I hope that she had a great Easter yesterday. If there are others of you who celebrated Easter yesterday, I, I did not know that, but uh, I am very happy for you, and I hope that that all went well. So please don't forget that we still have your final paper. I realize that for many of you, getting resources is very difficult. I totally understand. Uh, and what I'm very interested in is that you do well with the sources that you have. So it is perfectly possible, for example, that uh, you might only have, if you're doing something on Solzhenitsyn, you might only have the Gulag. And I think you could write an extremely good paper using the Gulag as a primary source. And I think that's probably true for most of you. Uh, if you do have your research with you, that is fantastic. Uh, I'll look forward to reading it. But all I would say is, Whatever resources that you have available, use those to the best of your ability. That's that's what I want to see. And uh, I'm eager to read your papers. Believe it or not, reading these research papers, both, uh, well, uh, these thought papers, these papers that you do for me in Christian humanism, as well as the ones that I have in my upper level classes are always kind of a highlight at the end of each year. I learn a lot from them. Uh, I learn a lot about you. I also learn a lot about your subjects. So please, uh, yeah, have fun with those, make them very interesting, keep them as pointed as possible, try and remember that these are papers dealing with the human person. And so you're looking not just at the human person, but the thoughts of the human person. You are attempting where possible to see the world as your subject saw the world. If you're dealing specifically with a, a person or a uh, maybe a couple of persons and a set of ideas. So all of that is going to play a role. And don't worry when I read the paper, I understand that I'm reading you reading that person. So we've actually got at least three souls at work, mine, yours, and the subjects. That's really when I asked you to do something, and it doesn't have to be, but when I asked you to do something that was intellectually biographical, that's what I was thinking, that we would get into the thoughts of a person. So don't intellectual biography should not be a scary term by any means. It simply means that we're looking at the mind and the imagination and the soul of a person. And those are hard things to gauge, definitely. Uh, very hard things to gauge. So how do we know that we're not putting too much of ourselves in? But also, how do we know that we're not putting enough of ourselves in? Uh, we would be foolish to write a paper and presume nothing but objectivity because it's always one soul speaking to another, and that's just a part of the liberal arts. That's part of our discourse. You know, it would be great if Aristotle could answer us. Uh, that's not going to happen yet. Maybe in eternity that'll happen. But we can still ask questions and search in the writings that he left for us, in the remnant of what he left for us in his legacy. We can see what's there, and that's just as true for Aristotle as it is for Russell Kirk or Eric Vogelin or Richard Newhouse or anyone else that you might be studying. For this class. So do remember that you've still got your paper left for me and you've got your final. And I don't know exactly what time that final is. I need to look that up, but it's whatever time the college is signed. So if for some reason, I, and I'm just making this up, let's say that uh, the final is scheduled, and I'm sure it will be some kind of crazy schedule. Let's say that it's scheduled for a one o'clock on a Thursday. Um, that should probably work for all of you. So let me give you a different example. That was a bad example, Brad. One o'clock, maybe that was wishful thinking. Let's say that it's a 10 o'clock on, uh, and let's not do Thursday. That's kind of boring. Um, let's do an exciting day. 
like Tuesday. Yeah, Tuesday, one of those exciting days. Okay, so 10 o'clock on Tuesday, but you live in Hawaii, and 10 o'clock Eastern time is something like, you know, four in the morning. I don't know if that's true or not. Um, I'm not going to expect you to take the test at that same time, but I do expect that if you can't take the test at the time that the college is assigned to us, that you will let me know privately and we'll work all of that out. So, um, hopefully we can get a, a way of understanding or a way that all of us are uh, on the same wavelength there. Okay, so paper, test, it's a beautiful day, really beautiful, kind of eager to get out, take the dog for a walk, maybe even violate in some way quarantine. I kind of feel like I'm speaking from the People's Republic of Michigan, where I'm under permanent house arrest. Not that I want to get political here, but you know, it's kind of weird. Can't buy gardening supplies. Our stuff that we're buying is limited. I know it's like that all over the country. Well, not all over the country. There are a few sane places. But yeah, we're living in a midst of insanity. Uh, good old Governor Whitless. Well, anyway, here we are. And it's a beautiful day. So no matter what the politicos say, the sun is telling us that God lives, that God loves us. Yeah, that's cool. I guess even on cloudy days, God still tells us that. But he tells us in a different way. I'm going to shut up on this stuff because I don't know where I'm going with this. And I should probably get into the lecture and stop staring outside. That's what I'm doing, by the way, when I look this way. Now, if I look this way, that means I'm staring at a whole... Well, you guys don't really want to know. It's just a pile of books. I'm kind of embarrassed. Uh, you can see how cluttered my office is behind me. That uh, It's even more so that way. Um, oh. Well, I, don't, I may cut that off, but there's that pen tape board too. Yeah. Oh, can I? And I, I do want to show you. Here's my my latest my latest toy. So that uh, and of course it's come a little late, but I don't know if you can see what it is. It's actually very bendy. Look at that. How cool is that? And that and that. It's a tripod for my camera, and you can bend it in all kinds of different ways. It looks like some kind of bad squid from Star Trek. That's what I think anyway, but I like it. Okay, I really should get into this class now. And uh, let's start talking. Okay, so we today are going to finish up Dr. Russell Amos Augustine Kirk, one of the greatest and most important figures of our semester. Certainly, he has been the centerpiece of the second half of the semester in the way that T.S. Eliot was the first half of the semester. So what I want to do today is I want to look through some of his arguments on the nature of norms, mores, and literature. And then I want to read from one of his stories called There's a Long, Long Trail a Winding, uh, which is one of my favorite stories by Kirk. And it has a lot to do with Clinton Wallace. If you guys remember last week when I talked about Clinton Wallace, the Knight of the Road, uh, the ex-con and parolee that Russell Kirk took care of. So I'm going to turn to one of Kirk's mid-career books, a book called Enemies of the Permanent Things, Observations of Abnormality in Literature and Politics that was published in 1969. And you can tell it was 1969 because it's got this ultra hip, totally weird, quasi psychedelic cover. So I, I don't know exactly what the publisher was thinking, but there it is, Enemies of the Permanent Things. Uh, it, it really does have an almost sinister look about it. So maybe each of those little art things here represent the enemies of the permanent things. I'm not sure, but I think there are probably more than four enemies. But then again, if we put that up, maybe I should go put that up in front of the mirror and into a double mirror. Can you imagine what that would look like in reflecting mirrors going back and forth all the way into the crazy eternal? Okay, well, Russell Kirk says at the beginning of his book, that nature has a way of imitating art rather than art imitating nature. But of course it goes both ways. And in part two, the norms of literature and a chapter called the purpose of humane letters, Dr. Kirk says, the aim of great books is ethical to teach what it means to be human. Every major form of literary art has taken for its deeper themes, what T.S. Eliot called 
the permanent things, those things that last simply by the nature of our humanity. The norms of human nature, Kirk continues. Until very recent years, men took it for granted that literature exists to form the normative consciousness. Right? So literature is not something that merely exists next to us. It has always been, up until the 20th century, a way of shaping our very understanding of ourselves as a people. So until very recent years, men took it for granted that literature exists to form the normative consciousness. That is, to teach human beings their true nature, their dignity, and their rightful place in the scheme of things. Such has been the end of poetry in the largest sense of that word ever since Job and Homer. And I just imagine, uh, I can see the delight in my girls, especially when they read Pride and Prejudice or when they read Emma. Uh, there's just this moment there, these, these turns in their lives, these awakenings to moral realities that uh, you just can't get, for example, in a TV show. Uh, and I have nothing against really well done TV shows, but it's different from our norms of literature and the way that literature can really bring the best out in each of us. The very phrase humane letters implies that literature is meant to teach us something about human normality. As Irving Babbitt wrote in Literature in the American College, humanism, which is derived from the Latin humanitas, is an ethical discipline intended to develop the qualities of manliness through the study of important books. The literature of nihilism, of pornography, of sensationalism, is a recent development arising in the 18th century, though has become much stronger in our time. With the decay of the religious understanding of life and with the decline of the great tradition in philosophy. This normative end of letters has been especially powerful in English literature, which never succumbed to the egoism that came to dominate the French letters at the end of the 18th century. The names of Milton, Bunyan, Dryden, Johnson, or in America, Hawthorne, Emerson, Melville, Adams, may be sufficient illustrations of this point. The great popular novelists of the 19th century, Scott, Dickens, Thackeray, Trollope, all assume that the writer is under a moral obligation to normality, that is, explicitly and implicitly bound by certain enduring standards of private and public conduct. Now, I do not mean that the great writer necessarily writes homilies. With Ben Jonson, he may scourge the naked follies of the time, but the good writer does not often murmur, be good, fair maid, and let who will be clever. Rather, the man of letters teaches the norms of our existence through parable, allegory, analogy, and holding up the mirror to nature. I want to repeat that. It's very important for Kirk. The true man of letters teaches the norms of our existence, what it means to be human, through parable, allegory, analogy, and holding up the mirror to nature. And this is one reason I had you read Canical for Leibowitz, and a reason I had you read Death Comes for the Archbishop. Each of these, in its own way, was a parable and an allegory. It had something analogous to the real world, and it was, in many ways, a mirror being held up to nature. As William Faulkner, the writer may write much more about what is evil than about what is good, and yet exhibit the depravity of human nature. He establishes in his reader's mind the awareness that there exists enduring standards from which we may fall away, and that which fall in nature is an ugly sight. Or the writer may deal chiefly with the triviality and emptiness of a smug society that has forgotten its norms. Often, in his appeal of a conscience to a conscience, he may row with muffled oars. Sometimes he is aware only, dimly, of the normative function. The better the artist, one almost may say, the more subtle the preacher. In other words, his art becomes truly art and not propaganda. Imaginative, imaginative persuasion, not blunt exhortation, commonly is the method of literary 
champions. And I can think of a number of different books in the 20th century that very much live up to this ideal of the moral imagination, both in showing its humor, like the Confederacy of Dunces, or Walter Miller's The Canticle for Leibowitz, or in showing the enduring norms through a more serious lens, such as The Edge of Sadness. Uh, these are great books to try and teach us what is the moral imagination. Or we can think of a book that does get into the nature of evil, like East of Eden, but does so in a way in which we see how blatantly wrong that evil is and how corrupt of human nature, for example, in the story of East of Eden, the unwoman is in that story. But we especially see this in things like T.S. Uh, Lewis's That Hideous Strength or Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, where we can in some way recognize what is analogous, but also at the same time see that there is a parable in all of it. So it was that the most influential poet and critic of our day, T.S. Eliot, saw himself as the heir of both Virgil and Dante. The poet, and by that word, Eliot meant the imaginative and philosophical writer in general. So not just one who writes poetry, but one who is endowed with the poetic imagination, ought not to force his ego upon the public. Eliot maintained instead, the poet's mission is to transcend the particular. As he wrote in Tradition and Individual Talent, the poet will find nothing new under the sun. Quote, it is not in his personal emotions, the emotions provoked by particular events in his life, that the poet is in any way remarkable or interesting. His particular emotions may be very simple or crude or flat. The emotion in his poetry will be very complex, but not with the complexity of the emotions of people who have very complex or unusual emotions in life. One error, in fact, of eccentricity in poetry is to seek for new human emotions to express, and in this search for novelty, it is in the wrong place, it actually discovers the perverse, not the norm. The business of the poet is not to find new emotions, but to use the ordinary ones, and in working them into poetry, to express feelings which are not in actual emotions at all. End quote. No poet ever seemed more normal than did Eliot himself. Yet few poets could have been more interesting face to face. I used to meet Eliot chiefly in bare little Edinburgh hotel parlors, where nobody could find him and lionize him, or in fussy London clubs, where the traditions of civility had swept emotion under the old turkey carpet. I marveled always at his calm kindness, and it came into my mind that the kindly man has comparatively little ego in the cosmos. Now think about that. The truly kindly man has little ego within the cosmos. In his private life, as in his poems, and in his criticism, and in his plays, Eliot abided by the permanent things, and from that fidelity came his quiet strength. A late Augustine, he has resolved not to be a literary show, not to exhibit himself, but to dress old truths in modern clothing. This was T.S. Eliot's first principle. And imagine when we dealt with things like the Wasteland, or when we looked at the Hollow Men, or Ash Wednesday, or the Four Quartets, what grabbed us was not new ideas but very timeless ideas put into modern clothing. That's what Eliot was so genius at, giving new accidents to essences that can never really alter. And this is what Kirk is getting at when he talks about the idea of permanent things in society, and especially permanent things in the nature of ideology. So to continue with Kirk, this principle prevailed until almost the end of the 18th century. Since then, the egoism of one school of the Romantics, now notice not all the Romantics, many of the Romantics, Tolkien in particular, were able to show 
all kinds of individualism, but within the larger norms of life and in nature and the supernatural. But since then, the egoism of one school of the Romantics has obscured the primary purpose of humane letters, and many of the realists have written of man as if he were a brute only, or at best, brutalized by his institutions. In our time, and especially in America, we have seen the rise to popularity of a school of writers more nihilistic than Eve ever were the Russian nihilists. The literature of disgust, of denunciation, sufficiently described in Edmund Fuller's Man in Modern Fiction. By the way, Fuller was uh, a great writer. He was the literary critic for decades at the Wall Street Journal. To the members of this school, the writer is no defender or expositor of standards, for there are no norms to explain or defend. A writer merely registers unreservedly his disgust with humanity and with himself, and then he makes money by it. <laughs> That's a great... I love that, right? So who are these guys? To the members of this school, the writer is no defender or expositor of standards, for there are no norms to explain or defend. A writer merely suggests unreservedly his disgust with humanity and with himself, and then he makes money by it. Oh, that's Kirk at his best. Yet the names of our 20th century nihilists will be forgotten in less than a generation. I, I have to agree with Kirk. All those writers of the 50s and 60s, people like John Updike and Philip Roth, they will be remembered barely, whereas the literature that was mocked at the time, such as The Lord of the Rings, will be remembered for centuries, if not for millennia. So I wanted to give you at least an idea of what Kirk is trying to get at with his norms of literature and his ideas of the permanent things as expressed in that body of literature. But I want to jump forward a little bit as well to something that Kirk says when he writes about what is going on in the modern era, because now he brings us up to figures that he really, really likes. And he gives us, not surprisingly, three of them. He gives us C.S. Lewis, T.S. Eliot, and J.R.R. Tolkien, and a few others as well, like Aldous Huxley and Robert Graves. But he's very concerned, especially with Tolkien and Lewis and Bradbury, more than anyone else. He writes, if imaginative literature, and by the way, if any of you are interested, I've now jumped. So I was in his second chapter on the norms of literature. I've now jumped to chapter number five called Rediscovering Norms Through Fantasy in my book, page 109. If imaginative literature has expired under totalist dominations, it is sick enough generally considered in the free world. Some of the most talented writers of our century have died within a few seasons as if carried off by a plague. Now, Tolkien was still alive when, when Kirk was writing this. So who's died? T.S. Eliot, Robert Frost, Aldous Huxley, C.S. Lewis, William Faulkner, Wyndham Lewis, and Roy Campbell. And their place, Tolkien, uh, Lewis, sorry, Kirk says, has not yet been feel, filled. Fiction obsessed by the morbid, the perverse, and the senselessly violent is applauded by the reviewers today. The death of art at the hands of a triumphant ideology in the communist states is paralleled by decadence or the death wish in what we vaguely call Western civilization. In literature, naturalism is quite worn out. In philosophy, logical positivism makes a very thin ghost. And in politics, liberal rationalism is at the end of its tether. Among modern men, the imagination is no less fatigued than the fabric of society. And notice how those two things go together. A strength in society is a strength in literature, and a strength in literature is a strength in society. By the way, Kirk was good friends, not only with Ray Bradbury, but with Flannery O'Connor as well. So, Kirk says, we may seem close to fulfilling the predictions made by Robert Graves in his fantasy Seven Days in New Crete. In that most readable little romance of the future, we are told that by the close of the late Christian epic, the world will have fallen together into a collectivist domination, a variant of communism, religion, the moral imagination, and nearly everything which makes life worth living will have been virtually extirpated. 
by ideology and atomic war. A system of thought and government called logicalism will in some ways rule the world, at least for a brief time. The deepest longings of humanity have been outraged. That is, the soul and the state stagger on the verge of darkness. This is what we need to understand when we look at all of these various things that are trying to understand post-apocalyptic literature and also trying to understand what dystopianism is. Kirk continues, if the moral imagination is de denied or suppressed, the person and the republic are bewildered. The decadent logicalism of our century, reflected in much of our literature, is death to the moral imagination, and so we must retrace our steps or perish. Unless humane literature is returned to its normative purpose, telling us what it means to be truly human, the degradation of the human condition may not be long delayed. Now, I don't want to keep reading too much from Kirk on this, but I do want to note what he says about, in particular, Ray Bradbury, who was, as I mentioned already, one of his close friends, in fact, one of his closest friends in life. Every one of us, Ray Bradbury wrote in a letter to me, has a private keep somewhere in the upper part of his head where, from time to time, of midnights, the beast can be heard raving. To control that to the end of life, to stay contemplative, sane, good-humored, is our entire work in the midst of cities that tempt us to inhumanity and passions that threaten to drive through the skin invisible strike spikes. This author of 300 Tales of the Fantastic knows the permanent things as well as the poet of the wasteland. That's a high, high compliment for Kirk. Bradbury is not writing about the gadgets of conquest. His real concerns are the soul and the moral imagination. When the boy hero of Dandelion Wine, in an abrupt mystical experience, is seized almost bodily by the glowing consciousness that he is really alive, we glimpse the mystery of the soul. When, in something wicked this way comes, the lightning rod salesman is reduced magically to an idiot dwarf because all of his life he has fled from the perilous responsibilities, we know the moral imagination. Soul, a word so much out of fashion nowadays, signifies a man's animating entity. That flaming spark, the soul, is the real space traveler in all of Bradbury's tales. I'm alive! That exclamation is heard from Waukegan to Mars and beyond in all of Bradbury's tables, ta fables. Life is its own end if one has a soul to tell it. The moral imagination is the principal possession that man does not share with the beasts, Kirk writes. It is man's power to perceive ethical truth, abiding law, in the seeming chaos of the events of our world. Without the moral imagination, man would live merely from day to day, or rather moment to moment, as the dogs do. It is this strange faculty, and by the way, I hope you guys can't hear my dog. His name is Chesterton, and he's barking up a storm out there, so if you hear that in the background, I apologize. But it's fitting that Kirk will tell us about the dogs. It is the strange faculty, inexplicable if men are assumed to have an animal nature only, of discerning greatness, justice, and order beyond the bars of appetite and self-interest. And the moral imagination which shows us what we ought to be primarily is what distinguishes Bradbury's tales from the futurism of H.G. Wells' fancy. For Bradbury, the meaning of life is here. It is now in every action that we take. We live amidst immortality. It is here, not in some future domination like that of H.G. Wells' as The Sleeper Awakes, that we must find our happiness. So, it will not do to treat of Ray Bradbury, despite his abhorrence of much in the modern world, and despite his distrust of man armed for the conquest of space, as if he were a prophet of the coming doom. For no recent writer is more buoyed up by the ebullient spirit of youth, and none more popular with intelligent young readers. 
Probably no one ever has written so understandingly of 12 and 13 year old boys as Bradbury does repeatedly, particularly in Dandelion Wine. With its prosaic romantic setting, there we have a good romantic, of Waukegan, Illinois, actually Bradbury's birthplace, and a thousand other American towns about 1928, perpetual youth and therefore perpetual hope defy in Bradbury's pages the fatigue of this century, and the ambitions of exploitative scientism. If spirits in prison, still we are spirits. If able to besmirch ourselves, still only we men are capable of moral choices. Life and technology are what we make of them, and the failure of man to live in harmony with nature is the failure of the moral imagination. That failure is not inevitable. To understand Bradbury's disquietude and his high hopes, we may look at the book about tragic human conquest of Mars, The Martian Chronicles, and at his book about the wonder and terror behind the facade of any little town, Something Wicked This Way Comes. Right? Those are the two great works of the moral imagination. The Martian Chronicles, and Something Wicked This Way Comes, but also Dandelion Wine. So I, I want to stop there with reading from Enemies of the Permanent Things and that great psychedelic woo cover. Yeah, yeah, I still hear Chesterton out there. He, he probably, I don't know if he likes psychedelic covers. It may really bother him. But then again, he may not be aware. Kirk should be right. You don't have that dog nature. And... That dog doesn't have our nature, but I still like him. He's really, really a cool dog, actually. Actually, I love him. He's a great dog. Okay, so, Kirk and fiction. Russell Kirk is, of course, best remembered as a writer of cultural conservatism, a critic of culture, a man of letters. He wrote over 30 books of philosophy in the broadest sense, understood as philosophy, not necessarily what Dr. Cole would teach exactly, but the idea of, of bringing all things together in literature and philosophy and history. He was excellent at it. One of the best prose writers I have ever seen. I read a little bit from him last week, and especially that speech that he gave to the Cuyahos back in 1954, that idea of love. But Kirk also, and this is kind of odd in some ways, and yet it makes perfect sense when you think about it. Kirk was also a writer of fiction. He wrote three novels. First novel was a bestseller. Back in the early 1960s, he wrote a book. It's kind of goofy, actually. I mean, it's got good stuff in it, but <laughs> it's, it's kind of cheesy. A book called Old House of Fear. And it began a tradition... In fact, it, it really did more than begin a tradition. It legitimized horror fiction in America. I think we could easily say that would, there would be no Dean Koontz, there would be no Clive Barker, there would be no Stephen King, not in the way that those people experience popularity, at, at least, without Russell Kirk. Now, H.P. Lovecraft really matters as well, but Lovecraft was not a popular writer in the way that Kirk or Stephen King were popular writers. But yeah, Kirk made a lot of money from his fiction. In fact, his first novel, Old House of Fear, which you guys obviously I didn't assign it to us uh, because I don't think it's that great of a book. His other books, his other novels are much better, but it sold more than all the other books that Kirk wrote combined in all their sales. His Old House of Fear still outsold every one of his other books, and it's where he made the bulk of his money. It, it, it essentially made him a millionaire. Uh, and it went through 17 printings. It was not out of print for years. It's back in print now. It was out of print for a little bit, but the new Criterion brought it back about a year ago. So it's in print at the moment. One critic at the time said it could be called the Old House of the Welfare State instead of fear. And I think there's a lot of truth in that. It's the story of a young romantic man who is hired to investigate some claims in a castle in Scotland. And it turns out that in this castle, there are these very vampiric creatures living who, of course, as vampires, they're also communists. 
and communists who are vampires. There's a damsel in distress. And I don't think I'm giving too much away to say that the book is such a sweeping romance that, of course, Kirk, the romantic young man, not only destroys the communist vampiric threat, but he also wins the girl and, therefore, the Scottish inheritance of a lord at the end of the story. Everything wraps up very, very neatly. Uh, I don't want to denigrate the story. It's better than anything, certainly, I could write. But even among Kirk's stories, where I think, I, I should say not even among, but among Kirk's stories, it's weak. Because Kirk was a really great fiction writer. So Kirk's very first short story was called America, I Love Thee. And it was a brutal affair back in the late 1940s. Really an autobiographical take on his years in the war. It's very bloody. It's very brutal. It's very cynical. After that, Kirk turned to writing horror fiction rather than just writing about a kind of psychotic killer. Uh, he writes horror fiction. And there's a great moment, uh, one of my favorite moments in Kirk's life, where he doesn't know exactly how he's going to survive. We're, we're actually in 1949 at this point. He's been working on his graduate degree at the University of St. Andrews for roughly a year. He had arrived in October of 1948. Remember, he had almost no money at all. He didn't get a full bar, right? He had applied for one, but did not get one. And so he was living really hand to mouth. In fact, he used to go to all the various student groups and every one of their meetings simply because he could get free food. And it didn't matter if it was the Young Evangelical Association of Christians or if it was the Communist Youth League. Uh, Kirk went. He wanted the food. And so he went to all these meetings. And of course, he got well known as well around Scotland around St. Andrews. Plus, he was pretty eccentric. And I think as an American, especially, he kind of stuck out. But this was how he was getting his food. And we actually have a moment in uh, his early graduate career where he basically is living only off breakfast. He is able to kind of get a good breakfast where he's lodging. And then that's what that's all he has for most of the day. And he's at a point where it's at the end of winter, still cold, it's in March, but it's the end of winter. And he decides that he's got to sell all of his winter clothes because he just doesn't have enough money for food. But he has submitted a short story to a new London magazine, the London Magazine of Mystery. And suddenly he gets a letter in the mail that says, this is one of the best stories. It was a story called Behind the Stumps. This is one of the best stories we've ever seen. They paid him a rather large amount of money with promises that they would keep publishing his future stories at that pay. And so Kirk was able to put himself through grad school by his short stories, uh, where he was making you know hundreds of pounds, which was a lot of money then, in order to write these stories. And he's doing this as he's in graduate school. So what's interesting is that in his lifetime, he only wrote 20 of these stories. That's it. He wrote three novels and 20 short stories. He tried his hand in another novel. There was one called The Indian Pipe that he wanted to uh, write. He never got it done. He had uh, some short stories that he wanted to write based on Alice in Wonderland. He never got those done. So his, his entire output for his life uh, in fiction was only 20 short stories and three novels. Now, that, that's obviously better than most of us uh, by far. But still, the fact that that's all he's able to get through when clearly the man writes like nobody's business and he can write all the time tells us where he put his priorities. As he said, he only liked to write his short fiction when he was truly moved by the nature of some idea or story. He didn't like to write fiction just for the sake of writing. It wasn't a job for him. It had to be a love or a hobby. And his short stories are truly excellent, except that. One, America, I Love Thee. Other than that, all of his short stories are good. There's one, I think, is uh, The Little Seller of Egypt, that, or Seller of Little Egypt, that I think is only okay. But there are other stories that he wrote that are just profound in so many different ways. And partly, it's because his short stories always deal with theological truths. Now, in the beginning... 
his stories tended to be more political. By the end, though, his stories were extremely theological. As, as one of my, my friends, professor at the University of Virginia, Vegan Garoyan, has said, one of the reasons that Kirk is so effective at writing the horror or the ghost story is because he believes that it is through this moral imagination of horror and ghost stories that we can actually be taught very effectively timeless theological truths. And so Vegan tells us in his own work on Kirk's fiction that there are always three things that we see in all of Kirk's short stories, uh, in the 20 different short stories, or at least 19 of the 20 stories. We see, number one, the idea of purgation. That is the idea that we will be tested by fire. If we are made of gold, we will pass through unharmed. If, however, we are made of straw, we will burn, but as one who is saved. So, clearly taking this from scripture. Number two, all of Kirk's short stories give us the idea of illumination. That is, they recognize who and what we are in the order of existence. They give us a sense of justice. So number one, we're tested. But number two, we recognize our place in the order of society. This illumination allows us not only to understand ourselves, but to understand our neighbor. neighbor. And then finally, number three, we are taught sanctification. We are taught the idea that through sacrifice, through the free we chosen sacrifice. We find the approval of the good, the true, and the beautiful. So Kirk really does give us these three things, purgation, illumination, and sanctification. This is what Vegan tells us. And we can imagine that if Kirk could write a book like The Conservative Mind, which is really 29 short biographies, and he writes about all who have passed away, except at that point, T.S. Eliot. Why can he not do the same thing in a fiction way, but write about the dead? And that's exactly what Kirk does. And just looking over the list of Kirk's stories, uh, the story behind the stumps, the one that he was able to, to right away make all that money on, uh, is an amazing story about the horrors of Michigan. Uh, it's a story called Uncle Isaiah, where you kind of imagine you've got a great Italian mafia uncle who probably committed a lot of crimes in society, but then repented of them on his deathbed. But now God uses him as a kind of angel of vengeance. Or the surly sullen bell, which is probably Kirk's most updikeish story in that it deals with the breakdown of a marriage and the inability of a man to demonstrate his true manhood. And thus, he loses both a woman as well as a young boy in all of this. Or in What Shadows We Pursue, uh, which is about what could happen in our libraries and just how alive are our books. Or The Princess of All Lands, which was based on a true story in which Annette Kirk, Russell's widow, was actually kidnapped by a couple of people at one point. And Kirk posits, well, what if she was the princess of all lands? What if she had the power of fairy as she was kidnapped? How would she deal with her kidnappers? Uh, or we have the one I'm going to read to you in just a moment. There's a long, long trail of winding, which Kirk won a major, major science fiction award for. Uh, best story by the World Fantasy Association in 1977. Uh, that's a big deal. Kirk won not only the Count Dracula Award in the 1960s, which was a big deal, but an even bigger deal when he won Best Short Story by the World Fantasy Association. And that award was determined by a very important science fiction writer and judge, a man who's sadly passed away not too long ago, Harlan Ellison, uh, was the one who was so taken with Kirk. But Kirk tries to explore a number of different ideas in all of this. So I want to turn for a moment to Kirk's story. There's a long, long trail, a winding. And again, this is the story written in 1976 that wins the 1977 World Fantasy Award. And we have a main character here by the name of Frank Sarsfield, who actually shows up in a couple of Kirk's stories. And we don't know exactly what's going on here. Here, there's a long, long trail of winding is an old American pop song. And so we find 
that Frank is born and he dies on one day in January 14th, different years, of course, uh, but die born and, and is dead on the same day. And we see a kind of uh, baptismal cycle in all of that. So I'm just going to read uh, from the story three different parts of it and to give you a sense of what Kirk's fiction was like. Along the vast, empty six-lane highway, the blizzard swept, as if it were meant to swallow all the usual and sensual world. Frank Sarsfield, massive though he was, scudded like a heavy kite before that overwhelming wind. On his thick, white hair, the snow clotted and tried to form a cap. The big flakes so swirled about his Viking face that he scarcely could make out the barren country on either side of the road. Remember when Russell and Annette met Clinton Wallace, he was walking through a blizzard down the highway that goes through their town next to their house. Somehow he must get indoors, he realized. Racing for sanctuary, the last automobile had swept unheeding past his thumb two hours ago, doubtless bound for the country town some 20 miles eastward. Westward, among the hills, the highway must be blocked by snowdrifts now. This was an unkind 12th of January. Blow, 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 thou winter wind. Twilight became almost began almost upon him, and soon he must find lodging, or else freeze stiff by the roadside. He had walked more than 30 miles that day, having in his pocket the sum of $29.30. He could not have put up at either of the two motels he had passed, had he could have put up, had they not been closed for the winter. Well, as always, he was decently dressed, a good wash-and-wear suit, and a neat black overcoat, and as always, he was shaven and clean and civil-spoken. Surely some farmer or villager would take him in, if he knocked on a door, Surely if he handed them a ten dollar bill, bill in his fist. People sometimes mistook him for a stranded, well-to-do motorist, and sometimes he took the trouble to undeceive them. But where to apply? This was depopulated country, its forests gone to the sawmills long before its mines worked out. The freeway ran through the abomination of desolation. He did not prefer to walk the freeways. But on such days as there was, there were no cars, even on the lesser roads. Had he run away from a hardscrabble New Hampshire farm when he was 14, and ever since then, except for brief working intervals, he had been either on the roads or in the jails. Now his 60th birthday was imminent, two days away. There were fewer bigger men than Frank Sarsfield, and none more solitary. Where was a friendly house, he wondered yet again. For a few moments, the rage of the snow slackened. He stared about, away to the left, almost a mile distant. He made out a grim, high clump of buildings on rising ground, a wall enclosing them. The roof of the central building was gone. Sarsfield grinned, knowing that this was a complex, knowing what it was. It was a derelict prison. He had lodged in prisons altogether too many nights of his life. His hand sheltering his eyes from the north wind, he looked to his right. Down in a snug valley beside a narrow river and broad marshes, he could perceive a village or a hamlet, a white church tower, three or four commercial buildings, some little houses, and beyond them a park of bare maple trees. The old highway must have run through or near this forgotten place, but the new freeway, freeway, freeway had sealed it off. There was no sign of a freeway exit to the settlement. Probably it could be reached by car only along some detouring country lane. In such a little decayed town, there would be folk willing to accept him for the sake of a pro-offered ten dollars, or better, simply for charity's sake, and talk with him as an amusing stranger who could recite every kind of poetry. He scrambled heavily down the embankment, and at this point, praise be, no tremendous wire fence kept the haughty new highway inviolable. His powerful thighs took him through the swelling drifts, though his heart pounded as the storm burst upon him afresh. The village was more distant than he had thought. He passed panting through old fields, half grown up to poplar and birch. A little to the west, he noticed what seemed to be old mine workings, with fragments of brick buildings. He clambered upon an old railroad bed, its rails and ties taken up somewhere. The new freeway had dealt the final blow to the rails. 
Here the going was somewhat easier. Mingled with the wind shriek, did he hear a church bell now? Could they be holding services at the village in this weather? Presently he came to a burnout little rain railway depot, and on the platform signboard still read the name Anthonyville. Now he walked on a street of sorts, but no car tracks or footprints sullied the snow. Anthonyville Free Methodist Church hulked before him. Indeed, the bell was swinging, and now and again family faintly ringing in the steeple. But it was the wind's mockery, a knell for the derelict town of Anthonyville. The church door was slamming in the high wind, flying open again and slamming once more, like a perpetual motion machine, the glass being gone from the church windows. Sarsfield trudged trudge past the skeletal church. The front of Eamon's general store was boarded up, and so was the front of what may have been a drug store. The village hall was a wreck. The school may have stood upon those scanty foundations which protruded from the snow, and no chimney of the decrepit cottages and cabins along Main Street, the only street, did any smoke rise. Sarsfield never had seen a deader village. In an open window of what looked like a livery stable converted into a garage, a faded cardboard sign could be read, Remember your future, back Social Security. And what was all left here? Not some gaunt old couple managing on charity? He might force his way into one of the stores or cottages, though on principle and prudence he generally steered clear of possible charges of breaking and entering. But what would be cold comfort? In poor Anthonyville, there must be some remaining living soul. Now, I, I'm pausing here for a moment because I love this image of him coming into this village in really a post-apocalyptic setting. He's two days away from his death. We know that. Uh, and what do we know? As he enters into this, he gets off the highway of life. And as he enters into this village, it's forgotten. It's desolate. He sees no living soul. His mittened hands clutching his red ears, Sarsville had plodded nearly to the end of Main Street. Anthonyville was Innsville, he saw now. River and swamp and new highway cut it off altogether from the rest of the frozen world, except for the drift-obliterated county road that twisted southward, lured new whither. He might count himself lucky to find a stove left behind in some shack that he could feed with boards ripped from these walls. Main Street ended at the grove or park of old maples, just a sugar bush like those he had tapped as a boy under his father's rough command. No, these trees had never been leafless. He might not have even discerned the big stone house among the trees, the only substantial building remaining in Anthonyville. But see it he did for one moment, before the blizzard veiled it before him. There were stone gateposts, too, and a bronze tablet set next to one of them. Varn Sarnsville brushed the snowflakes from the inscription, Tamarack House. Sp stumbling among the maples towards this promise, he almost collided with a tall glacial boulder. A similar boulder rose a few feet to his right, the pair of them halfway between gateposts and house. There was a bronze tablet on this boulder, too, and he paused to read it. Sacred to the memory of Jerome Anthony, July 4th, 1836 to July 14th, 1915. Brigadier General in the Corps of Engineer, Army of the Republic, founder of the town, architect of Anthonyville State Prison, who died as he lived with honor. And there will I keep you forever, yes, forever and a day, till the walls shall crumble in ruin and molder in dust away. There's an epitaph for a prison architect, Sarsfield thought. It was too bitter an evening for inspecting the other boulder, and he hurried towards the portico of Tamarack House. This was a very big house indeed, a bracketed house built all of square field stone, with beautiful glints to the masonry. A cupola topped it. Once, come out of the cold into a public library, Sarsfield had poured through a picture book about American architectural styles. There was a word for this sort of house. Was it Italianate? Yes, that rose in his memory, and he took pride in no quality except his power of recollection. Yes, that was the word, Italianate. He had visited this house before. He could not account for such vague familiarity. Perhaps there had been a photograph of this particular house in the library book, but he knew the house. 
Every window was heavily shuttered, and no smoke rose from any of the several chimneys. Sarsfield went up the stone steps to confront the oaken front door. It was a formidable door, but it seemed as if it had at some time been broken open, for long ago a square of oak with different grain had been mortised into the area around the lock and the keyhole. There was a gigantic knocker with a strange face upon it, and Sarsfield knocked repeatedly. No one answered. Conceivably, the storm might have made his pounding inaudible to any occupants, but who would spend the winter in a shuttered house without fire? Another bronze plaque was screwed to the door. Tamarack House, property of the Anthony family estate, guarded by protective service. Sarsfield doubted the veracity of the last line. He made his way around to the back. No one answered these back doors. Either they were too lo- or they were too locked. But presently he found what he had hoped for, an old fangled slanting cellar door set upon its foundations. It was not wise to enter without permission, but at least he might accomplish it without breaking. His fingers, though clumsy, were strong as the rest of him. After much trouble and with help from the Boy Scout knife that he carried, he pulled the pins out of the cellar doors, three hinges, and scrambled down into the darkness. With the passing of years, he had become something of a jailhouse lawyer, though those young inmates bored him with their endless chatter about Miranda. And now he thought of the doctrine, defense of necessity. If caught, he could say that self-preservation from freezing is the first necessity. Besides, they might not even take him for a bum. Okay, just to jump forward a little bit, as Sarsfield lives in the house after he's broken in, remember he breaks in two days before his death. So he breaks in on January 12th. In those two days, he starts to remember his life in this house. And he can't quite place it all, but he remembers very well loving three little girls in the house that he took care of in a a wonderful way, treated them almost as daughters. And he remembers the couple that lived in the house as well. So I'm going to just jump forward here in the short story a little bit to do different scenes until we get to the ending. Sarsfield adored little girls, but he distrusted the big ones. His mother had cautioned him against bad women so that he had kept away from such. Because he always liked peace, he had never married. Not that he could have married anyway, because that would have tied him to one place, and he was too clumsy to earn money at practically anything except dishwashing for summer hotels. Not marrying had meant that he could have no little daughters like Allegra. Sometimes he had puzzled the prison psychiatrists. In prison, it was well to play student, stupid. He had refrained cunningly from reciting poetry to the psychiatrists. So after testing him, they wrote him down as dull normal, and he was assigned to labor as gardener, which meant going around the prison yards, picking up trash by a stick with a nail in the end of it. That was easy work, and he detested hard work. Yet, when there was truly heavy work to be done in prison, sometimes he would come forward to shovel tons of coal or carry hods of brick or lift big blocks into place. That, too, was his cunning. It impressed the other jailbirds with his enormous strength, and so most of the gangs left him alone. You're a loner, Frank Sarsfield, he said to himself aloud. He looked at himself in that splendid Sunday parlor mirror that stretched from floor to ceiling. He saw a man, overweight but lean enough of face, standing six foot six, belt like a bear, with a strong nose, some teeth missing, a strong chin, and a rather wild, and rather wild, light blue eyes. He was an uncommon sort of bum. Deliberately, he looked at his image out of the corner of his eyes, as was his way, because he was nonviolent. The eye contact might mean trouble. You look like a Viking, Frank, old Father O'Malley had once told him, but you ought to have been a monk. Well, said Father O'Malley, you're no fool, more than many a brother, and you're a celibate and continent, I take it. Yet it's too late for that now. Look out you don't turn into a berserker, Frank. Go to confession sometime to a priest that doesn't know you if you won't go to me. If you'd confess, you wouldn't be as haunted. But Frank seldom even went to Mass, and never to confession. All those church boxes he had pilfered, 
his mother and his father abandoned, his sister neglected, all the ghastly, ghastly humbling of himself before policemen, all the horror and shame of the prisons. There could never be grace for someone like Frank now. There's a long, long trail of winding into a land of my dreams. What dreams? He had looked up Berserker and Webster, but he couldn't ever do that sort of thing. A man had to keep a control upon himself, and besides, he was a coward, and he loved peace. Now, just to make sure you guys know, a berserker is a Viking loner who was given the honor of rushing first into battle, into single combat with, a, with an enemy of the other line, usually went intensely crazy in the way that he would strike with his battle axe. Nearly all the other prisoners had been brutes, guilty as sin. One sentenced for rifling a church safe, he had been put into the same cell with a man who had murdered his wife by taking off her head. The head never had been found. Sarsfield had dreamed of that head in such short intervals of sleep as he had enjoyed while his wife killer was his cellmate. Nearly all night, every night, he had lain awake surreptitiously, watching the murderer in the opposite bunk and feeling his own neck now and again. He had been surprised and pleased when eventually the wife killer had gone hysterical and had obtained assignment to another cell. The murderer had told the guards that he just couldn't stand being watched all night by that terrible giant that never talked. Only one of the prison psychiatrists had ever been pleasant or bright, and that had been the old doctor born in Vienna who went around from penitentiary to penitentiary checking on the psychi psychiatric staffs. The old doctor had taken a liking to Frank and had written a report to accompany his petition for parole. Three months later, in a parole office, the parole officer had gone out hurriedly for a quarter of an hour, and Sarsfield had taken the chance to read his own file that the parole man had left in a folder on his desk. Francis Sarsfield has a memory that can almost be described as photographic. So had run one line in the Viennese doctor's report. When he read that, Sarsfield had known that the doctor was clever. He suffers chiefly from an arrest of emotional development, and he may be regarded as a rather bright boy in many respects. His three temporarily successful escapes from prison suggest that his intelligence has been much underrated. On at least one of these three occasions, he could have eluded the arresting officer had he been willing to resort to violence. Sarsfield repeatedly describes himself as nonviolent, and he has a record never of showing aggression when confined, nor in connection with any of the offenses for which he has ever been arrested. On the contrary, he seems timid and withdrawn, and might become a victim of assaults in prison were it not for his size, his strength, and his power of voice. Sarsfield had been very pleased by this paragraph, but he was puzzled by what followed. In general, Sarsfield is one of those recidivists who ought not to be confined were any alternative method now available for restraining him from petty offenses against property. Not only does he lack belligerence against man, but apparently he is quite clean of any record against women or children. It seems that he does not indulge in any kind of sexuality either, perhaps because of his strict instruction by his Roman Catholic mother during his formative years. I add, however, that conceivably Sarsfield is not fundamentally so gentle as the record indicates. He can be energetic in self-defense when pushed to the wall. In his youth, occasionally he was induced for the promise of five or ten dollars to stand up as an amateur against some professional traveling boxer. He admits that he did not fight hard and cried when he was badly beaten. Nevertheless, I am inclined to suspect a potentiality for violence, long repressed, but not totally extinguished by years of humbling himself in that phrase. The possibility is not so certain as to warrant additional detention, even though three years of Sarsfield's sentence remain unexpired. Frank had memorized nearly the whole of that old doctor's analysis, which he had got his parole from. There was one concluding paragraph. Francis Sarsfield is oppressed by a haunting sense of personal guilt. He is religious to the point of superstition and a Roman Catholic, and he appears to believe himself damned. Although worldly wise in a number of aspects, he retains an almost childlike innocence in others. 
His frequent humor and candor account for his success much of the time. He has read much during his wanderings and his terms of confinement. He has a strong taste for good poetry of the popular sort and has accumulated a mass of miscellaneous information, much of it irrelevant to the life he leads. Although occasionally moody and even surly, most of the time he subjects himself to authority and will work fairly well if closely supervised. He possesses no skills of any sort unless some knack for wood chopping acquired while he was enrolled in the Civilian Conservation Corps during the New Deal, if this could be considered a marketable skill. He appears to be incorrigibly footloose, and therefore confinement is more unpleasant to him than to most prisoners. It is truly remarkable that he continues to be rational, given his isolation and his healthy guilt complex considered. But distinctively, Francis Xavier Sarnsfield is neither dull nor normal. Well, the story continues, and it, it's a long story. As I said, I'm not going to read everything. But we find that over and over, Sarsfield keeps remembering this life that he had in this house, but he can't quite place it. We have one other memory I want to give before we get to the end of the story. By the way, Mary once upon a time, Father O'Malley told me that to the Lord, all things is eternally present. Right? It was kind of an awkward sentence, but what matters most is that God is outside of time. All time is eternally present. Right? A line from Eliot. I think this means everything that happens in the world in any day goes on all at once. This is a letter Frank wrote to his sister trying to describe it. So let me write that again. I'll read that again. By the way, Mary, once upon a time, Father O'Malley told me that to the Lord all time is eternally present. I think this means everything that happens in the world in any day goes on all at once. So God sees what went on in this house long ago and what's going on in this house today all at the same time. It's just as well we don't see through God's eyes because then we'd know everything that's going to happen to us. And because I'm such a sinner, I don't want to know. Father O'Malley says that God may forgive me everything and that he may actually have something special in store for me. But I don't think so, because why would God care about me? And Father O'Malley says that maybe some people work out their purgatory here on earth, and that I might be one of those chosen souls. He says we are spirits in the prison house of the body, which is like we were serving time in the world here below, and maybe God forgive me long ago, and I'm just waiting my time and paying for what I did, and it will already be all right in the end. Or maybe I'm being given some second chance to set things right. But as Father O'Malley puts it, to do that, I'd have to fortify my will and I'd have to make some single act of contrition. And so we jump forward to the end of the story. So profound had been his sleep, deep, deep almost as death, that the siren may have been wailing for some minutes before it at last aroused him. Frank knew that horrid sound. It had called for him thrice before, as he had fled from prisons. Who wanted him now? He heaved his ponderous body out of the warm bed. The candle that he had brought up from the Sunday parlor left burning all night was flickering in its socket, but by the flame he could see the hour on his watch. It was seven o'clock, too soon for dawn. Through the narrow skylight as he flung on his clothes, the sky glowed an unnatural red, though it was long before sunup. The prison siren ceased to wail as if choked off. Frank lumbered to the little window and saw to the north, perhaps two miles distant, a monstrous mass of flame shooting high into the air. The prison was on fire. Then came shots outside. First the bark of the heavy revolver, followed irregularly by blasts of shotguns and rifles. Frank was lacing his boot with a swiftness uncongenial to him. Uncongenial to him. He got into his overcoat as there came a crashing and battering down below. That sound, too, he recognized. A woodchopper that he had always been. Axes were shuttering the front door of the Tamarisk house. Amid this pandemonium, Frank was too bewildered to grasp altogether where he was or even how this catastrophe might be fitted into the pattern of time. 
All that mattered was flight. The scheme of his escape remained clear in his mind. Pull up the chair before the skylight. Heave yourself out onto the upper roof. Descend those iron rungs to the woodshed roof. Make to the other side of the freeway. And then, you must trust a circumstance, Frank. It's that long, long trail of winding for you. Now he heard a woman screaming within the house, and he slipped and fumbled in the alarm. He had got upon the chair, opened the skylight, and was trying to obtain a good group grip on the icy outer edge of the skylight, when someone knocked on the door and kicked at the door of Frank's room. Yet those were puny little hands and kicks. He was about to heave himself upward in a relative quiet. Now, I, I do want to remind everybody, Frank is going in and out of memory here. He isn't quite sure what's happening now in the middle of this winter as he's gone into this deserted house versus what had happened when he was taking care of the three kids and their family earlier on. And obviously God saying, right, all time is present, right? Our father O'Malley saying that for God, all time is present. The, the house is experiencing these timeless moments and Frank is moving in and out of time depending on what's happening. Now, clearly it's a moment in time where there's been a prison break and remember the man who's in charge of the house had been the architect and the warden of the prison. So they're attacking his house. Yet those were puny knocks and kicks. He was about to heave himself upward when in a relative quiet, the screaming had ceased for a moment. He heard a shrill little voice outside his door, urging pleadingly, Frank, Frank, let me in. He was arrested in flight as though great weights had been clamped to his ankles. That little voice he knew, as if it were a part of him himself. It was Allegra. For a brief moment, he still meant to scramble out of that skylight and leave. But the sweet little voice was begging. He stumbled off the chair, upset it, and was at the door in one stride. Is that you, Allegra? Open it, Frank. Please open it. He turned the key and pulled the bolt. On the threshold, the little girl stood, indistinct by the dying candlelight, terribly pale, all tears, frantic. Frank snatched her up. Oh, this was the real Allegra, Anthony, all warm and soft and sobbing, flesh and blood, and he kissed her cheeks gently. She clung to him in terror and then squirmed loose, tugging at his heavy hand. Oh, Frank, please come. Come downstairs. They're hurting Mama. Who is, little girl? He held her tiny hand, his body quivering with dread and indecision. Who's down there, Allegra? The bad men. Come on, Frank. Braver than he, the little thing plunged back down the garret stair into the blackness below. Allegra, come back here! Come back here right now! He bellowed it, but she was gone. Up two flights of stairs, there poured to him a tumult of shrieks, curses, laughter, breaking noises. Several men were below, their speech slurred and raucous. He did not need Allegra to tell him what kind of men they were, for he heard prison slang and prison foulness, and he shook all over. Still, there still was the skylight. But could he escape? He would have to turn his back to that hole in the room, had not Allegra squealed in pain somewhere on the second floor. Days trembling, unarmed, Frank went down three steps down the garret staircase. Allegra, little girl, what is it? Allegra! Someone was charging up the stair towards him. It was a burly man in a prison uniform, a lighted lantern in one hand and a glittering axe in the other. Frank had no time to turn. The man screeched obscenely at him and swung that axe. In those close quarters, wielded by a drunken man, it was a chancy weapon. The edge shattered the plaster wall. The flat of the blade thumped against Frank's shoulder. Frank, lurching forward, took the man by the throat with a mighty grip. They all tumbled pell-mell down the steep stairs, the two men, the axe, the lantern. Frank's ursine bulk landed atop the stranger's body, and Frank heard his adversary's bones crunch. The lantern had broken and gone out. The convict's head hung loose on his shoulders. Frank found as he groped for the axe. Then he trampled over the fallen man and flung himself along the corridor, gripping the axe helm. Allegra! Allegra, girl! From the head of the main stair, he could see that the lamps and the candles were burning in the hall and in the rooms of the ground floor. All three children were down there, wailing, and above their noise rose Mama's shrieks again. A mob of men were stamping, breaking things, roaring with amusement and desire, to shouting their filth. A bottle shattered. 
his heart pounding as if it would burst out of his chest. Frank hurried rashly down that stair and went, all crimson with fury, into the Sunday parlor, the double-bited axe swinging in his hand. They were all there, the little girl's mama and five wild men. Stop that, Frank roared with all of his power of his lungs. You let them go. Everyone in the parlor stood transfixed at that summons like the last trump. Allegra had been tugging pathetically at the leg of a dark man who gripped her mother's waist, and the other girls sputtered and sobbed, cornered as a tall man poured a bottle of whiskey over them. Mrs. Anthony's gown was ripped nearly its whole length, and a third man was bending backward by her long hair, as if he would snap her spine. Near the hall door stood a man like a long, lean rat, the rat of Creep Mouse Town, a shotgun on his arm, gate-jawed at Frank's intervention. Guns and axes lay scattered about the Turkish carpet. By the fireplace, a fifth man had been heating the poker in the flames. For that tableau moment, they all stared astonished at the raving giant who had burst upon them, and the giant, puffing, stared back with his strange eyes. Oh, Frank! Allegra sobbed. It was more command than entreaty as if Frank thought in a flash of insane mirth he were like the boy in a fairy tale who could cry confidently, All heads off but mine! He knew what these men were. They were rats. They were bats. They were from the creep mouse town. They were the worst men of any prison. The lifers, those who made their hell upon earth, killers of all and worse than killers. The rotten damnation showed in all those flushed and drunken faces. And then the dark men let go of Mama and said in relief with a coughing laugh, Oh, hell, it's only pumpkin-headed Frank clowning around. Frank, come on, have some fun. Come on, boy. Hey, Frank, Ratface asked, his shotgun crooked in his arm. Where'd the old man keep his money? Come help us find it. Frank towered there, perplexed, the berserker lust draining out of him, almost bashful, and frightened worse than ever before in all of his years on the trail. What should he shout now? What should he do? Who was he to resist such perfect evil in his midst? There were five to one, and those five were fiends from hell, and one, he, a coward. Long ago, he had been weighed in the balance, and surely God had found him wanting. Mama was the first to break the tableau. Her second captor had relaxed his clutch upon her hair, and she plotted the little girls before her, and she leapt for the door. The, the, the hair puller was after her at once, but she bounded past Ratface's shotgun, which had wavered towards Frank, and Alice and Edith were ahead of her. Allegra, her little eyes wide and desperate, tripped over the rug of the broken chair, of the rung of a broken chair. Everything happened in a split second. The hair puller caught Allegra by her little ankle. Then Frank bellowed again, the loudest bellow he had ever bellowed in his life, and he swung his axe high above his head and downward, a skillful, deadly stroke, catching the hair puller's arm just below the shoulder. At once the man began to scream and spout, and Allegra fled after her mother. Falling, the hair puller collided with Ratface, spoiling his arm, but one barrel of the shotgun fired and Frank felt pain in his side, his bloody axe on high. He hulked between the five men and the door. All the men's faces were glaring at Frank incredulously, incredulously as if demanding how he dared stir against them. Three convicts were scrabbling tipsily for weapons on the floor. As Frank strode among them, he saw the expression on those faces change from gloating to desperation. Just as his second blow descended, there passed through his mind a kind of fleshy collage of death he had seen once at a farmyard gate. The corpses of five weasels nailed to a gatepost by the farmer, their frozen open jaws agape like the damned souls in hell. All heads off but mine, Frank heard himself braying. All heads off but mine. And he hacked and he hewed, and his own screams of lunatic fury drowning their screams of terror. For less than three minutes, shots, thuds, screeks, crashes, terrible wailing. They could not get past him to the doorway. Come on, Frank was raging as he stood in the middle of the parlor. Come on, who's next? All heads off but mine. Who's next? There came no answer, but a ghastly rattle from one of the five heaps that littered the carpet. Blood soaked from hair to boots, the berserker towered alone, swaying where he stood. 
His mind began to clear. He had been shot twice, Frank guessed, and the pain of his heart was frightful. Into his frantic consciousness burst all the glory of what he had just done and all the horror. He had become almost rational. He needed to count the dead. One upstairs, five here. One, two, three, four, five heaps. That was correct. All present and accounted for. Frank Boyd, Pumpkinhead, Crazy Frank. All dead and accounted for. Had he thought that before? Had he taken that mock roll before? Had he wrought this slaughter twice over, twice in the same room? But where were Mama and the little girls? They mustn't see this blood-splashed inferno in their parlor. He was looking at himself in the tall mirror, and he saw a bare man loathsome with his own blood and others' blood. He looked like the wild man of the wilds. In abhorrence, he flung his axe aside, fighting him draw, sprawled the reflections of the hacked dead. Fighting down his heart pain, he reeled into the hall. Little girls, Mrs. Anthony, Allegra, Allegra! His voice was less strong. Where are you? It's safe now. But they did not call back. He labored up the main stair, clutching his side. Allegra, speak to your Frank. But there was none in the bedrooms. He went up the garret stair, and then whatever the agony, and beyond Frank's room to the cupola stair, and he ascended that slowly, grasping hard. They were not in the cupola. Might they have run out among the trees? In that cold dawn, he stared on every side. He thought his sight was beginning to fail. He could see no one outside the house. The drifts still choked the street beyond the gateposts, and those two boulders protruded impassive from untrodden snow. But back down the flight of stairs, he made his way, clutching at the rail, at the wall. Surely the little girls hadn't strayed into that parlor butcher shop. He bit his lip and peered into the Sunday parlor. But the bodies were gone. The splashes and ropey strands of blood were gone. Everything stood in perfect order, as if there had never been violence in the Tamarack house. The sun was rising. The sunlight filtered through the shutters. And within fifteen minutes, the trophies of his savage victory had disappeared. It was like the recurrent dream which had tormented Frank when he was little. He separated from Mama in the dark, wondering solitary in empty lanes, no soul alive in the universe but little Frank. Yet those tremendous axe blows had severed living flesh and bone, and for one moment there on the steps he had held in his arms a tiny quick allegra. Of that reality he could not doubt at all. Wonder subduing pain, he staggered to the front door, and it stood unshattered. He drew the bar and turned the key and went down the stone steps into the snow. Was he weak now? And did not know where he was going? Had he done a signal act? Might the Lord give him one parting glimpse of little Allegra? Somewhere among the trees? He slipped in a drift, half rose, sank again, crawled. He found himself at the foot of one of those boulders, the further, the one that he had not inspected. The snow had fallen away from the face of the bronze tablet. Clutching the boulder, Frank drew himself up. By bringing his eyes very close to the tablet, he could read the words, A dying man panting against deathless bronze, in loving memory of Frank. A spirit in prison, made for eternity, who saved us and died for us. January 14th, 1915. Why, if the soul can fling the dust aside, and naked on the air of heaven ride, Weren't not a shame, weren't not a shame for him, in this clay carcass crippled to abide. God bless everybody.